All right, in this video, we are going to discuss the seven quality control tools. This is the seventh concept of total quality management. And in that concept, it talks about some of the various quality control tools that can be used to help manage quality. And so these are very useful. Uh, first of all, uh, the seven uh, different uh, tools that we're gonna go over right now are very useful in your career, whether you're in quality uh, management or operations management, supply chain management, it doesn't really matter. A lot of these tools are very useful and they can be used in other applications, not just quality management. But for sake of today's conversation, we're going to apply them to quality management, but you can use them in other areas of your organization as well. So the seven quality control tools are tools for generating ideas, tools to organize data, and tools to identify problems. Those are the three subcategories within the quality control tools. The tools that help us to generate ideas, so to help us brainstorm ideas to see you know, where we need to focus our efforts, that is check sheets, scatter diagrams, and cause and effect diagrams. Next, we've got tools to help us organize the data that we have. So put it into a, a manner that makes sense to us to help us start that problem solving process. Uh, that would be Pareto charts and flow charts. And then lastly, tools to help us identify problems are histograms and statistical process control charts. And so I'll show you an example of a statistical process control chart and then um, chapter 6S or the supplement to chapter 6. We're going to learn how to create different control charts uh, using upper control limits, lower control limits, and then there's various different kinds of statistical process control charts that we can make. And so that will be everything that we learn in chapter 6S. So our very first TQM tool, the, the tools, you know, when we talk about the seven, um, a check sheet. A check sheet is a tool for organizing and collecting data. It helps us to take a tally of the problems or other events by category. This helps us to generate ideas. This doesn't tell us what the problem is, but it tells us where to look. So a check sheet's an organized method for recording data. Uh, it's a simple tool for problem identification. And so just by looking at this very simple check sheet that we put together, you can see that the, most of the defects are with A. You can also see that most of the defects occur, whether it's defect A, B, or C. You can see that most of those defects occur in the first hour or the seventh or the eighth hour. Okay, very easy to see that. So it kind of tells you where to start looking. Let's just say this is a service firm, right? And these are employee mistakes. Um, maybe people are tired when they get into work in the morning. So more defects start to happen in the very first hour. People have their coffee. They start to wake up a little bit more, but then they get tired by the seventh and the eighth hour. So they start making more errors because they're tired and they're fatigued. Maybe if this is a machine that's making the errors, maybe when we turn on that machine in the morning, it's not calibrated or it's not warmed up. Maybe by the end of the day, it's also out of calibration and it needs a tuning or it's too hot. Whatever it may be, this doesn't solve problems. It just tells you where to look. And it's a very simple and useful tool for gathering data. The next is a scatter diagram. We went over this in chapter four in forecasting. It's a graph that shows the degree and direction of a relationship between two variables. So uh, the example here is that productivity goes down as absenteeism increases. That makes a lot of sense. Things like exam scores. I know that the more people study and they do the practice problems and, and uh, some of the, the uh, helpful hints that are out there in, in my labs, like the study guide, the more time you spend, the higher your exam score will be. So again, a scatter diagram, we've already went over that in the chapter on forecasting, but it's a graph that shows the degree and direction of a relationship between two variables. If there isn't a clear linear relationship, then those two variables probably um, are not correlated to each other. The next is a cause and effect diagram. Okay, a cause and effect diagram. This is also known as a fishbone diagram. Why? Because it looks like a fishbone. So the cause and effect diagram is a diagram used to organize a search for the causes of a problem. And that problem can be materials, methods, manpower, or machines. So they're all starting with M. Materials, methods, manpower, or machines. 
It's also known as a fishbone diagram. So let's look at the example for this fishbone diagram. If the problem is missing free throws, okay? So if, if this were me and I'm a, you know, let's just say I'm a 60% free throw shooter. Well, is it Brent's issue? Is Brent the only problem here? Well, maybe, maybe I'm just not very good at free throws and that's probably true in real life. So maybe it's manpower, but let's figure out why. Okay, this is a tool for generating ideas, okay? So what could it be if it's my issue? Am I not concentrating? Am I not motivated? Have I not trained well? Am I out of shape? These are all the issues it could be if it's a Brent issue. But what if it's not me? What if it's the material? Okay, what if it's the ball that I'm using? What if it doesn't have any grip left to it? Uh, what if there was a, a Tom Brady issue and the air pressure was all wrong of that basketball? Maybe I'm using the wrong size ball, right? Uh, maybe I'm using my children's ball when I'm shooting free throws and it's too small, uh, whatever it may be. So maybe it is an issue with the ball and that would be an issue with the material. So this helps us to generate ideas. We're gonna go through each one of these issues to see what it could be and it will help us to identify the cause and then the effect. So method, is it just you know my aiming point? Is it, I'm not bending my knees? Uh, is it my hand position or the follow through? That's all the method of free throw shooting. And then is it the machine? Maybe the backboard's out of alignment. Maybe the rim is the wrong height. Maybe the rim is the wrong size. These are all things that it could be as well. So if your problem, essentially your effect, is missed free throws, a fish bone diagram looks at all the probable causes and you brainstorm them together and generate the ideas for what could be the issue because of the missed free throws. Okay, the next one is tools for organizing data. So now we're moving on to organizing data. A total quality management tool that I use all the time is a Pareto chart, okay? Also known as the 80-20 rule. It's a graph that identifies and plots problems or defects in descending order or frequency. So in, in, in the chapter on quality management, we're looking at defects, right? But I use these all the time in my career to look for opportunities. As a supply chain professional, I want to look and see where the majority of their spend is. I do an analysis like this that says, okay, where is all their spend? And that helps me to identify where I want to address, where should I spend my time? Do they spend the most money in chemistry or microbiology or anatomic pathology? So I do a Pareto analysis to see where the biggest opportunities are. But for this class and in this chapter, this is on quality management. So this graph, when we do the Pareto analysis, we've already got the data. So we have data. We have hotel complaints in this example. And when you plot the data out and you organize it using a Pareto analysis, you can see that you overwhelmingly have a problem with room service. Next, you have problems with check-ins. Some people are unhappy that the pool uh, isn't open early or late. Some people can't get into their mini bar, and then you've got other complaints that are miscellaneous. So if I'm managing this hotel operations, I know that I need to address issues with room service, okay? So it helps us to organize the data um, after we've already gathered it. So what, so for example, what you would do first, you do the check sheet, okay? So you take all of your customer complaints for this hotel and you plot them out and you say, okay, is it room service? Is it check-in? Is it the pool hours? And then you would check where the customers complained, and then you can organize the data into a Pareto analysis. Now, this is good. This tells us room service is the majority of the complaints. What you would need to do next is a progressive analysis. So this is a Pareto diagram, but you can see we've done it four times. So in the last example, if room service was the issue, why? Does the food arrive cold? Is the person who delivers, you know, rude to me? Do you not like paying the automatic 25% tip or whatever it may be, or fees and, you know, that kind of thing? Or did they forget silverware? You would do the progressive analysis to determine where are my issues with room service? And so then you narrow it down step by step by step because generally 80% of your problems are attributed to 20% of the causes. And Joseph Jerome is the one who, who made that point, that more often than not, you've got 
just a few problems that are, that are uh, cascading throughout the organization. So if you look at the example on the screen, defects in parts per million, it's a little small to read, but you can see which assembly has the most defects. So they did a Pareto analysis and they determined that assembly number five has the most defects, not assembly number two or assembly number one or assembly number nine. They've got by far the most defects with assembly number five. Well, next, what are the most common types of defects in assembly number five? Well, we're having electrical issues with assembly number five. It's not, it's not the um, assembly, it's not the soldering, it's the electrical issues. Okay, what kind of electrical issues are we having? What is causing the most defects with electrical components? Well, it's our K2 relay. Then you keep working your way down. You do a progressive analysis. You're doing Pareto analysis after Pareto analysis. This is helping you to organize data. And lo and behold, the K2 relay is having thermal failure issues. And that is the problem that you would address first. This is where you start. After you address that problem, come back a couple weeks later, recheck the data, and then figure out what your next biggest issue is. And then you start there and you continually work on that process improvement. And then your quality will get better because you're addressing all the defects that you're encountering. So a Pareto uh, diagram is extremely useful. I use them all the time. Okay, a flowchart is the next total quality management tool that helps us to organize data. Uh, the flowchart is a visual representation of a process. And it's very simple to make these. Um, you, you literally just go and you begin with a list of steps. You can write out all the steps in a process. You classify each one of them as a process or a decision. So generally, the rectangles are a procedure or an activity in the process. And diamonds indicate a decision point. So you'll many times when, when people are doing a, a Kaizen event in an organization, uh, that's a lean tool that we'll cover later. Uh, you will walk into these rooms and you will see that all over the walls, they've got post-it notes and it's laying out a flow chart or a flow diagram of all the steps in the process. And they're looking to see where are steps, where are decisions being made and where is there opportunity for error or what steps are non-value added that we could eliminate. So a flow chart is very good in organizing data and looking at a process. Uh, it's a visual representation of that process. Okay, the next total quality management tool is a histogram. A histogram is a chart that shows an empirical frequency distribution, um, generally between uh, time or events. Uh, so in this case, you can see you've got repair time uh, and your frequency. So let's say this was uh, an oil change, okay? on the, the, the number that's the highest. So the, the largest distribution, the repair time is 10 minutes. Let's say that this is 10 minutes for an oil change. If you go a little bit to the left, one step, this is how many oil changes take nine minutes. This is how many oil changes take eight minutes. This is how many oil changes take seven minutes. And this is how many take six. If you go to the right, this oil change took 11 minutes. This one took 12, 13, and 14. So you can see it's just an empirical frequency distribution of how often things are happening. So it's helping you to identify problems. Another very good tool for identifying problems is what we're going to go over next in statistical process control. And this is a control chart. This is a run chart with two horizontal lines called control limits to interpret patterns and draw conclusions. So you've got an upper control limit and a lower control limit, and then your process mean is the center line. Now, using the example that I just said on that last page was oil changes. Let's say the mean or the center line is about 10 minutes. And sometimes it takes nine, sometimes it takes 11, no big deal. But for that process, what happens if an oil change takes three minutes? Is that a bad thing? Probably. It sounds good to finish a job fast, but more often than not, you probably forgot some steps. So there's probably a defect or an error there when something doesn't follow the mean. On the flip side of that is what happens if an oil change takes 30 minutes? There was probably a problem in the process there as well. So control charts help us to determine if a process is in control or out of control. And there's lots of different things that can be measured with a control chart like this, like 
the weight of a bag of chips or the temperature of a cup of coffee at a restaurant, uh, the time it takes for an oil change. There's lots of different things you can do to see if a process is in control or out of control using control charts. So those are the seven different total quality management uh, quality control tools uh, that we've gone over. So there's seven of them. They're all very useful uh, uh, for quality management and in other areas of your career as well uh, if you go into operations management.